Landscapes have been a muse for the arts for centuries. From literature to photography, artists have rendered landscapes to great effect, whether that be sprawling vistas of the American West or vertiginous cliffs of China. The medium of film provides yet another avenue to capture these sites, and does so in ways previously unavailable to traditional art forms. Erwin Panofsky writes that the unique and specific possibilities of film can be defined as dynamization of space and accordingly spatialization of time. Expanding on this observation, Kenneth Helfand has noted that there are aspects of landscape experience best communicated through film. Examples include motion, scale, activity or temporal change. And he continues to identify four major ways landscapes have been rendered by cinema. 1. Landscape as setting. 2. Landscape as character. 3. Landscape as symbol. And 4. Landscape as subject. This video essay will focus on the latter, that is, films that feature landscapes as the subject of the films themselves. As we shall see, the unique characteristics of film identified by Panofsky and Helfand are especially emphasised in these types of landscape films. This video will thus proceed by introducing some of the key filmmakers, films and scholars that consider landscape in this way, before concluding with a brief overview of why these types of films are important to consider. Landscape films are almost as old as the medium of film itself. Some of the earliest examples of such are those of Robert Flaherty, an American filmmaker and explorer often considered the founding father of documentary and ethnographic film. Flaherty's most notable work is Nanook of the North, a film about an Inuit family living in the Canadian Arctic. A great deal of attention has been focused on the stage scenes of Nanook of the North, which ambiguate the line between fiction and reality. For this reason, the film often features in debates concerning the ethics of documentary filmmaking. However, the film also encapsulates the key characteristics and themes of many landscape films that would follow. As Helfand writes, the theme is often human-environment relationship, the limitations the landscape places upon us, the human transformations of the landscape, and the cultures people have developed by interacting with the landscape. Above all then, the landscape experience is one of dynamic encounter between people and place. Although this does not necessarily require that people always be present in landscape films, sometimes their absence can be just as evocative of these themes. A brilliant example of this can be seen in Fogline by Larry Gottheim. Filmed in 1970, Fogline is an experimental short silent film that features one static shot for 11 minutes. The frame encases a rural scene shrouded by fog, which slowly lifts to partially clarify the elements in the image previously hidden trees in the distance, high tension wires splicing the frame horizontally, and the faint silhouette of two horses grazing. In his book, The Garden in the Machine, Scott MacDonald makes the case that despite the deceptive simplicity of the film, the compositional elements of Fogline are carefully considered and conceptually rich. In particular, MacDonald notes that the film recalls the technological and aesthetic lineage of the filmic and photographic medium, writing, it is only once the fog has thinned enough for an identification of the image to be possible that we can recognise that something other than the movie projector, the fog itself, is moving. This first recognition is reminiscent of the development of photography during the early 19th century. Indeed, the gradual appearance of the landscape image out of a milky green abstraction is suggestive of the process of photographic development itself, and then, during the second half of the century, of motion photography. The two horses materialising out of the thinning fog suggests the fascination with the movement of horses that led Edward Muybridge's earliest motion studies and his zoopraxiscope, a forerunner of the motion picture projector. MacDonald later continues, The moment the linear elements of the image are recognised as indexes of the technological aesthetic history that produced the motion picture camera and the illusion of Renaissance perspective that the motion picture camera is designed to mass produce 24 images per second, we can recognise that Fogline foregrounds not simply natural landscape, but the intersection of natural process and human technological development. We can see a similar allusion to the intersection in the experimental landscape films of James Benning. Ten Skies, for instance, is a film that features ten long static shots of ten different patches of sky. Like Fogline, the products of both natural and technological processes are overlaid in Ten Skies. The various cloud formations are often tainted by various human pollutants such as industrial smog, jet engine trails, and accidental wildfire smoke. 
In effect, these extended shots capture the shift that has occurred in the relationship between people and place in the 20th and 21st centuries, and by extension, how this shift has affected the way landscapes have been depicted in artworks. On this shift, MacDonald writes, The importance of landscape in American cultural history hardly needs comment at this late date. Landscape was a dominant issue in American painting and writing throughout the 19th century, and, as a wealth of cultural commentary suggests, has remained crucial throughout this century, as the 19th century fascination with wilderness and nature increasingly gave way first to a focus on cityscape and city life, and more recently to a fascination with the forms of human signification that in our postmodernist period are the inevitable overlay of both countryside and city. What is often overlooked as this cultural trajectory is charted, however, is that earlier fascinations do not simply disappear. Often they are taken so much for granted that, in effect, our consciousness of them becomes repressed. Their very obviousness tends to render them invisible. The simplicity and duration of Ten Skies compels the viewer to confront these sites as a subject, bringing back into consciousness the earlier fascination with landscape that MacDonald mentions. Another striking example of a film that encapsulates this landscape, or rather seascape experience, is Leviathan by Lucien Castaigne Taylor and Verena Paravel. Filmed in New Bedford, Massachusetts, Leviathan viscerally captures life on board a commercial fishing vessel. Like Fogline and Ten Skies, Leviathan represents a subversive vision of cinema, one that neither relies on linguistic expression nor makes a reductive claim to truth. The film departs from the conventions of documentary filmmaking. There is minimal dialogue, no interviews or narration, and no factual information about the fishing industry is disclosed. Instead, Cassain Taylor and Paravel embrace the various dimensions of the audiovisual image to make the sensory experience of commercial fishing directly perceptible. In doing so, Leviathan recognises the nuances and uncertainties that lived experience entails, and it resists simple reductions that suggest otherwise. Castaigne Taylor articulates his methodology when saying, One of the things that we are trying to do is make films that don't say anything. Anything that humans make are always about something in some way, but to imagine they could be about something that could be expressed in words outside of the fabric of the film itself is kind of ludicrous, because then you wouldn't make the film, you would write it. Castaigne Taylor's comments express why these types of films are important. The films mentioned in this video essay prioritise the unique, formal attributes of the audiovisual image and challenge you to look at and to listen to the film itself. As MacDonald recognises, these two skills have waned among contemporary viewers. That viewers have been trained and have trained themselves to feel that landscape is not a legitimate subject for even a 10 minute film experience provides us with a measure of how different our sensibilities are from those of art lovers of a previous century. Indeed, when I ask viewers immediately after a screening of Fogline what they've just seen, a frequent response is a sardonic nothing. Without overt human characterization and plot, contemporary film viewers are virtually blind to imagery and issues that fascinated artists and audiences alike during the 19th century, and they are blind regardless of the considerable visual subtlety and conceptual density of both Fogline and Sky Blue Water Light Sign. The landscape experience is inherently cinematic. Helfand argues that the characteristics of film provide unique contributions to the analysis of landscapes. Whilst this is a sound observation, I would also add that the characteristics of the landscape experience present the opportunity to exalt the distinct ontology of film. Landscape films not only consider landscapes a worthy subject to meditate on, but they also consider cinema a worthy medium to express ideas that simply cannot find form in any other way. In this vein, the value of landscape films, and indeed experimental films more broadly, rests in their ability to foreground cinema as a medium itself.